A tiny detail can be a key to solving the crime. The sum of small details leading to the main clue. Little things. But there's nothing more important than little things in an investigation. The most notorious felonies of the past. I'll tell you how decades ago, criminologists sent criminals behind bars without relying on special equipment, surveillance cameras, and electronic databases. What an investigation was like when the most intricate crimes were solved only with the help of intuition and obtained physical evidence. The Evidence. Darling, what are you doing? I'm playing school. I want to be a teacher. In the fall of 1942, the Nazi occupants' militia broke into Dr. Dubrovin's house. Get up. Move it. Get dressed. You've got two minutes. Get outside. Stop! We've arrived! Get out! Mommy! Daughter! Go! Leave her! Let her live! Daughter! That morning, Lilia Dubravina became an orphan. The lame Nazi militiaman fired at her parents from a machine gun and then went to finish them off. During the war against Nazi Germany, about 400,000 Soviet citizens changed sides to fight against their own people. They did the dirtiest bloody work, hung, shot, beat innocent compatriots to death. After the liberation of occupied territories, these hundreds and thousands of Nazi militiamen and death squad butchers were executed, but many of them still managed to escape the deserved punishment. For the long 23 years, the traitors who had shot Lilia Dubravina's family were hiding from the just retribution. And thanks to this light bulb, the detectives managed to get on the trail of the Black Squad. Electricity widely came to Soviet homes in the 1920s of the last century. But at that time, the voltage of the electric network was 127, not 220 volts. After the war, the voltage was changed with an eye on power saving. The higher the voltage, the less material is needed to produce wires. The transition process was unsystematic and dragged on for decades. It was not rare when part of the city was already using the 220 volt power grid while the other powered its appliances with a voltage of 127 volts. Eyewitnesses recalled that during the transition to a new system, fires often occurred in houses. A light bulb burned out in Lilia Dubravina's apartment. The woman smelled smoke. Lilia took out the phone book and dialed the utility office. Hello? 
Hello, is this the utility office? My light bulb burned out. Yes, it smokes. Write down the address. Who's there? An electrician. Come in. Half an hour later, a man in his 50s showed up. Tall, neat, without the usual smell of alcohol. He stood on a stool and unscrewed the burned out light bulb. Oh, I see. The light bulb is a carbon thread and your house is connected to 220. You need a light bulb with a metal thread. The utility office must have warned you, didn't they? Yes, they did. I'll buy one from my next salary. What's your job? A school teacher. So? Take a light bulb. Go to school. And when no one is there, unscrew it. Lily just noticed the electrician's ring finger. It was short of one nail bone. The woman saw this finger 23 years ago. On that very morning, her parents were shot. The school won't get poorer. The country is rich enough. As soon as the electrician left, Lilia picked up the phone and dialed the police office. She said that an electrician from her utility office had collaborated with the Nazi militia during the war. Hello, police. I have information for you. This is Sergei Gorovoy, born in 1915. For the last 10 years, the man has worked as an electrician at a utility office, married, and has two children. He was conscripted in July 1941, and a week later, after his unit ended up encircled, he was taken prisoner. For about 18 months, he was kept at a POW camp near Bilitsevska city. He managed to escape and joined a guerrilla detachment. After the city's liberation, he rejoined the army and reached Berlin. Yes, yes, come in. Detective Vaznetsov asked himself an obvious question. What are the chances that a five-year-old girl was able to remember the Nazi collaborator? Moreover, Gorovoy was in captivity, which means he had to undergo a series of scrupulous checks. Lilia, I have carefully read your report. Let's be clear. You do not believe me. Well, not quite. You see, you were only five years old. And it was such a long time ago, too. That's something that can't be forgotten. I understand you. But I can't jail a war veteran just because he's missing one finger. Electrician Gorovoy's personal file contained testimonies of people who shared camp captivity with him, a prisoner's card, a military ID issued in 1943, and war decorations. Detective Vaznetsov felt really awkward having to talk to Gorovoy's workmates. Offering a compelling reason for the police's interest in such a reputed man was quite a problem. He served as a horseman for the Nazi police. When they drove us, they were all staying mute. When we arrived, the horseman said that guerrillas had burned down the farm. The commandant ordered 50 people to be shot for this. That's exactly how many pigs were burned on the farm. The woman told that after, the Nazi policeman took a silver watch off her father's wrist and tore a pendant off her mother's neck. Her father gave this pendant to the woman's mother for her birthday, an amber stone with a fly inside. I was supposed to have been killed too, but they spared me. I beg you. Let's go to Bila Tserkva. I'll show you Praskovia's house. The Nazi militiaman lived in this house during the war. Praskovia, the house owner, had to identify Gorovoy. I'm sure. Mm. 
Lilia and the operatives arrived in Bilicerka, but they were disappointed. The neighborhood where the building housing Nazi militia 20 years ago used to be was now packed with new residential blocks of apartments that mushroomed in cities during Khrushchev's era. The 1960s saw a huge boom of panel building construction. It took just a week to erect one story. The pace of construction was really stunning, while the size of apartments was rather disappointing. It's because of the tiny rooms that these blocks of apartments were labeled as Khrushchev slums. Rumor had it that when Nikita Khrushchev was personally inaugurating one of these such buildings, somebody frowned at the cramped toilet. The party leader said, if I can squeeze in, anyone else can. These are the resident lists of the new district in Bila Tserkva, which the detectives used to find someone named Praskovia. It was exactly her house where the Nazi militia personnel lived during the city occupation. Praskovia Smirnova, born in 1895, was registered at number 5 on Pilova Street. Praskovia Smirnova lived with her daughter. The girl confirmed that during the occupation, Nazi collaborators lived in their house. At that time, she was just two years old. Madam, do you recognize this man? Vadek? No, this is not Vadek. His name is Sergei. Sergei Gorovoy. Do you remember him? Vadik! Did he live at your place? The daughter said that Vadik was her father's name. Two years ago, Praskovia fell off the stairs and badly hit her head. Since then, she can barely recognize anyone. She confuses names. And when she sees any photo, she shouts out, Vadik. Where is your father? He dumped us and left for Germany along with the Nazis. It turned out that Praskovia's husband was a photographer working at the city's top-rated photo studio. When the Nazis came to Bilicerkva, Vadim became the personal documentarian of the city commandant. Have you kept the photos? Mom burned almost the entire archive. Something remained, but very little. Can I see these photos? Yes, I'll get them right away. So, the detective was holding photographer Smirnov's archive. The Germans loved documenting their every step. They either brought a photographer from Germany or found someone local for the job. Among these pictures, the detective hoped to find an image of electrician Gorovoy or any other evidence that would help him get on the trail of the Nazi militiamen. No, no. And here? Here. It's him. This is the horseman. Soon, electrician Gorovoy was found in several more photographs. Suddenly, Lilia Dubrovina caught her breath. In one of the pictures, she recognized the man who shot her parents. Unfortunately, the face of this Nazi henchman was not visible, only a silhouette but Lilia would never mistake him for anyone else. Short, slim, round-shouldered, with a lopsided shoulder. She still remembered him limp as he was walking off to finish her parents after the execution. In 1942, during the occupation, Lilia Dubrovina's parents were shot by the Nazi militiaman. The girl was only five years old. 23 years later, an electrician who had served as the death squad's executioner entered Dubrovina's apartment. The detective is in no hurry to detain the electrician, Sergei Gorovoy. He believes that Lilia was too small to remember the Nazi. The woman persuaded the detective to go to Bila Tserkva city. She hopes that in photographer Smirnov's archive, they will find some evidence that will help get on the trail of the Black Squad. Going through the pictures, Lilia recognizes the man responsible for her parents' execution. It seemed like an ordinary photo. 
Nazi militia with rifles in front of the house number 90. What did the detectives spot in this picture? It turns out that in August of 1941, 19 children from the orphanage were herded into the basement of house number 90 on Gorky Street. For several days, they were not given any food and water. In order to save themselves from hungry death, the children scraped clay and limestone from the walls. Three days later, the Nazi militia went down to the basement and shot everyone. Finding the sadist who committed this atrocity has become a matter of honor. That same evening, the detective decided to detain electrician Goroboy. Detective Vizhnetsov's bet was that the former horseman would lead him to the main suspect. Knife! Quickly, quickly! Hurry! He couldn't be saved. Well, what have we got? Too late. Call the investigators. How could Gorovoy know that they would be after him? The answer was in the note. He addressed the first part of it to his wife and son, and the second part to the detective. I was young and weak. I just wanted to live, but now I don't want to, I can't. I won't give out any names. I don't want him to take revenge on my family, Gorovoy. Detective Vizhnetsov blamed himself for not believing Lilia Dubrovina at once. Now, he was absolutely committed to finding the person who shot Lilia's parents, and who most likely had the blood of another 19 kids on his hands. Detective Vizhnetsov studied the archive of photographer Smirnov across the board. The suspected killer appeared in another picture. Unfortunately, the face of the executioner was unidentifiable. However, the investigator found interesting descriptions behind the Nazi backs. Detective Vaznetsov had a hunch. To check it, the detective scoured several stables in Belitserkva to finally find out what he was looking for. Little has changed in the stables since then. A board on the wall against which the Nazi militia took pictures of themselves was still up on the wall. Kandiba. Paris. Kandiba. Kandiba Keris Block. Detective Vizhnetsov guess was confirmed. It turns out that in order to personalize the harness, the militiamen scratched their names or nicknames under the four nails to the board. This was still to be dealt with. So the Nazi militiamen's names or nicknames were in the detective's hands. There was no general logic in the inscriptions, though. Gore, it could have well been the nickname of horseman Gorovoy. Kandiba could be a reference to both a lame horse or a lame rider. But Kieris and Bliach, these could well be family names, though very uncommon ones. The detective suggested that, by judging the photographs, the Nazis' age range between 35 to 40, which means that at this time they must be around 60. Orientations with the names Bliach and Kieris were circulated across the whole of the Soviet Union. Chances for success were quite high as the all-union population census had been held in the country lately. The first census after the war, the authorities delayed this step for a long time to keep real losses unknown. The government's objective was to demonstrate the population growth and to make it happen. Census enumerators traveled to the most remote areas of the union. 
The first news came from the city of Bratsk. Anatoly Kieris worked there as an engineer at the construction of the Bratsk hydroelectric power station. He was born in Fatsov, 40 kilometers from Bila Tserkva. In 1938, his father was convicted and executed for espionage. Anatoly Kieris formally relinquished his father's name and moved to Bila Tserkva to work as an engineer. In 1941, he was taken prisoner. During his displacement to Germany, he escaped and joined the guerrillas. The detective met with Kieris in a Moscow television studio. As a merited worker with a number of groundbreaking construction sites in his portfolio, Anatoly was invited to appear on Blue Light TV show. The Blue Light TV show was Soviet viewers' favorite program. It was aired on occasions of the greatest national holidays, but the show culminated on New Year's Eve. It featured the biggest variety and movie stars the funniest comedians, and the first special effects. Most celebrated workers were also introduced as stars comparable to actors, singers, and cosmonauts. Anatoly, could you tell me what you were doing in the fall of 1942? I was with the Grozny Guerrilla Detachment and spent the entire fall of 1942 in a dugout. Are you sure? Absolutely. But why isn't your service reflected in your personal file? October 1942 turned out to be very cold. Karas's detachment had been in hiding for the second month. It's cold. Why don't we fire up the stove? Forget it. They can spot us. Oh, come on. Otherwise, we're going to freeze to death. Anatoly persuaded his friend to fire up the stove. <sighs> Told you. <sighs> that is definitely more fun. Five minutes later, the Germans spotted smoke and began shelling the camp with mortars. We're spotted! They'll hit us from behind! Stop! Where to? When the fire ceased, Kieris climbed out of the dugout and found his friend dead. Sasha! Sasha! Anatoly never recalled his guerrilla past, blaming himself for the death of his brother-in-arms. Kieris' fellow fighters corroborated his testimony. At the time when orphans were massacred and Lilia Dubrovina's parents were killed, Anatoly Kieris was in another place, based in the Kerensky forest of Voroshilovgrad, now Luhansk region. A new clue led the detective to a special camp in Vorkuta, where Vasily Blech, sentenced to 25 years of penal servitude, was doing his term. Vasily's appearance left no doubts. Even 20 years later, the Nazi butcher appeared and the yellowed photograph could be easily recognized. The detective recommended Bilek to recollect and tell in detail what he was doing in the fall of 1942. I was in Bila Tserkva, cooperating with the Nazi militia. Little chores, you know, nothing criminal. I was stupid, boss. Stupid. Who is it? The detective made it clear that telling the truth was in Bliek's best interest, especially all the truth concerning the lame man in the photograph. And if you play around, you'll end up in capital punishment instead of the remaining four years. Gorovoy? Keres? And this is Kandiba. Bilyech explained that the stooped man in the picture was Leonid Kandiba, which is his real name. The guy has been lame since childhood after he fell on the ice. Kandiba was born in the Cherkasy region. What he did before the war is unclear. He was secretive. He told almost nothing to anyone. 
How and where did you meet him? In 1942, he came to our POW camp to recruit people for his squad. Okay, must be hungry, eh? The one who runs up to this bowler first gets some food. Kandiba lined up the prisoners, walked 10 steps back, and placed a bowl of meat on the floor. So why are you frozen? Run! Three of them ran, Liech, Gorovoy, and Keres. Keres was the first to reach the bowl, but Kandiba did not let him eat. Three of you will join my squad. And I will talk with you now. That was how Bliech, Gorovoy, and Keres were enlisted in the Black Squad. The prisoner who did not run for the bowler was shot by Kandiba. He needed fighters ready to cut throats for food. And no loose ends anymore. Bliech's testimony allowed to establish Keres's identity. Keres, which stands in for Sherry in Russian, was a nickname of someone named Mikhail Pokutny. In 1937, he fought on the side of the Republicans in Spain, was awarded a medal, although this medal played a cruel joke on him. So you say you served in Spain, right? It was 1937. With the Republicans. I even received a medal. You don't say? Seriously? I did, yes. Do you have any relatives? Children? I have a mother, wife, but no children. So, let's drink to Kernis then. To our hero, to General Franco's enemy. Take it. It was necessary. He was a good man. Kandiba approached Keras, who was still alive, took off his silver watch, and tore Lilia Dubrovina's mother's amber pendant off his neck. Then he searched his pockets and took the documents. Since then, Leonid Kandiba became Mikhail Pokutny. Nice papers. Exactly what I need. Mmm, yes. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. Let's have a drink. Then we fled to Krimki with Kandiba. His father lived there. There, Sly Kandiba got a job at a bakery. And I went to the Nazi militia once more, a moron, for which I paid the price. Back from Spain in December 1937, at ease. I was awarded a medal for the Ebro battle. Full name? Bliach Vasily Petrovich. To be honest, I don't know how I survived. I was concussed. Now, I'm limping. After testing, everyone split into two groups. Shishkin, to the left. Torovsky, to the right. Black, to the right. Lazarenko, to the left. Kandiba found himself in a line of residents who were not involved in ties with the Nazis, but Bliech got into the group of Nazi collaborators, deserters, and Vlasov army personnel. In 1942, during the Nazi occupation, the policemen shot Lilia Dubrovina's parents. The girl was just five years old. 
The investigation revealed that Leonid Kandiba was in charge of innocent people's executions, including 19 children from the orphanage. The detective found Vasily Bilyeh, Kandiba's henchman, who told that the former Nazi militiaman lived under the name of Mikhail Pokutny. So the detective managed to find out where Kandiba was last seen, Krimki village. Most likely, after the check, he tried to hide. But the census data suggested that his father still lived in this village, and it was only possible to hope that Kandiba Sr. was still alive and in his right mind. Vasily, open up! What is it? We need to talk to you about your son. Come in. Kandiba Sr. said that he had not seen his son for 20 years and had no clue about where he was and what he did. If he has forgotten his father, then I don't need such a son. Do you have any pictures? No, I don't. I had a fire. Everything burned to the ground. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Old man, where does this great fish come from? The fish? My relatives from Nikolaev sent it. I see. Goodbye. Goodbye. The detective was lucky to have a fellow detective, Nosov, an avid fisherman, join him that day. This fish is a Baikal Umul. The Baikal Lake is the only place where it can be found. I see. So the old man is lying. Omul was a hallmark of the Soviet Union, like the circus, ballet, and astronautics. In 1966, this rare fish was even depicted on a postage stamp. Generous residents of the Baikal region would often send parcels with dried omul to grateful relatives. Everyone who lived in the Soviet Union remembered that exciting moment when a parcel notice arrived in the mailbox. In those days, mailing food and parcels, canned food, pickles, and even fresh meat and poultry was quite common. To preserve the content from perishing, one only had to wrap the foodstuffs in salted linen and to screw holes in the box. In those days, people preferred boxes made of plywood. It was easy to erase the address and reuse them. In the morning, the detective went to the post office. There, Vaznetsov was told that Kandiba Sr. had for many years been receiving parcels in the fall. These shipments always originated from the same place, Gramachinsk, the center of the Baikal fishery. The investigator hoped that the sender of these shipments would be Pokutny. It was under this name that the wanted Nazi militiaman was last seen. It wasn't the case, though. Who is the sender? Here, it is a different name every time. Papugin, Durakov, Osintsev, Varzin. Papugin, Durakov, Osintsev, Varzin. How remarkable. Each of these names used individually wouldn't stir up anyone's suspicion, but listed one after another, they offered an obvious clue for the detective. These were the names of the Soviet Union national field hockey team players. Now Papukin, the best striker of our team, regains the ball. Nikolai Durakov still breaks through the defense on the 36th minute, and an accurate pass, and Osinsev scores! It was clear that the packages to Kandiba Sr. were sent by a hockey fan. But the old man was reluctant to share who this mysterious sender was. The detective went to Gramachinsk, where all the parcels arrived from. No place is better for getting lost than the endless taiga. Vaznetsov hoped that he would find Kandiba there. Hello. Hello. You are not dressed for the weather, comrade detective. 
I can already see it myself. Can you suggest a local store I could buy boots at? The woman said that the vending truck arrives in their neighborhood once a week on Sundays. And since today was Monday, the only way to avoid five days of waiting was to buy boots from a shoemaker. Thanks. That's exactly what I'll do. You know, I'm looking for a man about 60. He often comes here to send parcels. Everyone knows each other here. Maybe you can help me find him. Grimechinsk is a small fishing village with some 100 households. The detective was sure that all the villagers knew each other. But the post office worker upset Vaznetsov. I don't know everyone. On Tuesdays and Fridays, the postman goes around all the villages within a range of 200 kilometers, collects letters and parcels from everyone, then brings them over to the post office. There's no way for me to know everyone. And the next pickup day is in two days, right? Yes. You know, the person I'm looking for is lame. Does that bring anyone to mind? The woman's lameness is not anything special for locals of whom ex-military, lumberjacks, and fishermen were the majority. Can you give me their last names? Sure. Okay. Will you write them down? Sure, I will. Okay. Stepanov. Stepanov. A tractor ran over his leg in the fall. The postwoman begins to list the names, commenting along the way on the circumstances the person became disabled. And Fedotov jumped from the second floor. They had a fire. And that's all. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. Goodbye. Goodbye. The detective realized that he was stuck here for a long time. And for a start, his priority was to change shoes for boots. These boots are almost new. They sell at half price compared to the store. I'll take them. Plus your shoes. What if without my shoes? Well. Then the price will be as for a new pair. But they're not new. Did you bring it? Come in. While the detective was choosing boots, a visitor came to the shoemaker. A young boy took out the men's boots from the package and gave them to the master. The detective noticed that the heel on the left boot was much more worn than on the right one, which is typical of lame people. However, the guy did not limp. He must have brought somebody else's shoes for repair. Tell your mother that her lame foot guy should walk more carefully. She keeps buying him new shoes. But her post office salary can't be that generous. Stepanov. Stepanov had hurt his leg after being hit by a tractor. Kostyra worked as a sapper and blown up on a mine. It turned out that the postwoman's son came to the shoemaker. He brought his mother's companion shoes to repair. Yes, yes, I'll be there on Tuesday. Say hi to Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Lady, where did you get this pendant from? Why are you asking? Well, I like it. I want to buy one for my wife. Well, you won't find the same one anymore. It's a handmade thing, a gift from my husband. You see a fly there? Well, he says that I'm like an annoying fly. Why didn't you tell me that your husband is also lame? Uncle Fedya was a very good friend of my dad's. But when my father died two years ago, he began to live with us. How does he treat you? How does he treat me? He beats me. Okay, I'm not going any further. There is a boat station. Look for him there. Great. Thank you. Goodbye.
Goodbye. Leona Kandeba, you're under arrest. For what? You are suspected of murdering the Dubrovin family and 19 children. It can't be him. I don't believe it. Hands up! Raise your hands and throw away the axe. Here he is, Leonid Kandiba, 23 years later, and he still stood trial for his atrocities. Lilia Dubrovina and Vasily Bliech testified against him. Former Nazi militiaman Kandiba moved the court to pity, explaining that in his childish years, kids often bullied him over his lameness. Kandiba said that his cruelty was fueled by people surrounding him. The court rendered a death sentence to Leonid Kandiba. The verdict was met with applause in the courtroom. Lilia Dubrovina worked at the school all the way until her retirement. Up until the last days, she did not part with her mother's pendant.